Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Samantha Saki from The Self Club. Really excited to be doing this video for you. Um, this is also you know, a podcast, so make sure you check out the Standout Get Noticed podcast for other episodes as well. All right, Samantha, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I am really excited to have you on the show because today we're diving into a, into a topic that is kind of big and kind of scary, but necessary for for people, for anyone who's interested in developing themselves and achieving great things. Um, but before we get into that, so you're the founder of The Self Club and you call yourself a consciousness expansion officer, <laughs> that is CEO of The Self Club. Can you explain, Samantha, what does that actually mean? I'm glad somebody finally asked me. <laughs> So the consciousness expansion officer, I thought was a funny way to call myself a CEO. Yeah. Um, and that's basically what I consider my purpose. Everything that I do with the self club and everything I'll ever do is how can I expand the consciousness or individual consciousness of who we are, of why we're here, right? Of who, what we're doing as humanity on the planet. I know I got a little transcendental, but yeah, I think everything is about expanding our awareness and consciousness basically. Yeah. And what first got you really excited and passionate about doing this? I like to think that I've been doing this my whole life. Like I've been writing since I'm 12. And because I've moved over 18 times, I was always very like aware and conscious of how different we all are. And so, yeah, I feel like I've been writing. And then when I was 15, I asked my mom, can I please go to a psychologist because I need to understand myself more. Wait, wait, wait. When you were 15, yeah, you asked to go to a psychologist. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's because we just moved from Miami to Spain and it was so hard and I had so many attitudes that I was aware of that I couldn't get over. So I'd have like a really bad attitude with my mom, which maybe is normal when you're 15, but I didn't want to have that attitude, but it was like bigger than me. Mm. So, you know, and, and it was, I left my friends back home and my dad stayed back in the US and it was just so confusing. Um, and so, yeah, I just knew that I needed, I needed to know more than I knew at that moment to kind of like overcome my circumstances. Right. And what did you discover at that age? Well, I, I have like vague memories of the sessions. Um, I just remember like exploring, right? Like having that space to explore, like why and what do I feel this? And then just bringing to light things like I always thought in extremes, right? Like black or white. I was like, wow. And then I remember, I, this is actually the only thing I remember from my sessions. I did a lot. And she was like, well, could there be something in the middle, right? If you didn't go to this extreme or that extreme, how, how would it look like if it was in the middle? And it was such a simple question, right? But it was like, oh, hmm. well. And then it just got me thinking of that. And it made me, and again, this is where the consciousness comes in. It's like, oh, wow, things could be another way than how I am currently perceiving them. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and that's magical when we realize that, our perception of reality is really quite subjective yeah. and we can change it. And what a big realization to have when you're a teenager <laughs> as well. So what what did you do then like once you'd finished school? What was your what was the path that you pursued there? Um, I knew that I wanted to leave Spain um, for, for college and my dream was always to go to Italy. So I did, um, I, I thought, you know, I studied economics because I thought it would give me like a really wide understanding of the world and how it works. And uh, yeah, so I did this double degree in, in international business and economics in two years in Budapest in Hungary and two years in Milan, Italy. And that was incredible. Mm. So a lot of consciousness expansion there and learning of, of you know, new cultures. And, um, and yeah, and, and I kept writing. I remember always having so many projects and, you know, I remember this one called Globalized Me and, you know, all these blogs and things. So... So you've always had an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. 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 And I know that that is something that you are particularly passionate about, about well, with working with others, about helping people to cultivate that as well, um, which is something I'd really love to talk more with you about today. Um, mm -hmm. So can we start at the very sort of base level when we talk about self-awareness, right, because a lot of this self, you know, consciousness and understanding ourselves, it all starts with the level of self-awareness. So can you explain, Samantha, what that is exactly? Yes, that is one of my favorite topics in the world. <laughs> and I do say everything starts with the self. Yeah. And everything starts with awareness. So before 
we can do anything about anything, we have to become aware of what it is, right? It's like, oh, can you solve this problem? Well, what's the problem, right? You have to understand it. The same goes with the self. So self-awareness, there's two kinds of self-awareness. There is internal self-awareness, which is how you perceive yourself and what you know about yourself. And then there's external self-awareness, which is how what you know about how you are perceived. So how others see you, mm -hmm. how aware you are of that. And both of those make up self-awareness. Okay. It's, I think it's a... I mean, I'm pretty sure it's a lifelong process. There's not, there's like the day never comes where, okay, now I am fully self-aware because mm. it's, there's so many layers of it. And I also like to think that n knowing and understanding yourself is, is basically infinite because you know how we're just exploring space and it's like this whole discovery, right? And like, we don't know what we don't know. So we keep discovering new things. And first it was planets and there's new galaxies and these concepts we don't even know of. And I really believe that the inner world is just as deep as as outwards. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's like infinite ways to go in. And I feel also as humanity, we're just starting to explore psychology, the mind, the body, like the, the infinite intelligence that is how our body functions. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's so many levels of self-awareness, right? From understanding how our physical body works. Right. So would that be like first, the first level? Like what's my physical body doing or how it works? Um, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. No, I would say that the first level is understanding not understanding, because that's actually an, an excellent. It's just noticing, okay, and perceiving your thoughts, mm -hmm. your emotions, and your physical state. Okay, so I'd say the three things, right? Right. What am I feeling physically? And that can be as simple as like, wow, my arm hurts, right? That's right. a level of awareness. Or it can be as identifying your own emotions, right? So like, wow, I am angry. <laughs> and this this sounds really silly right now and simple, but a lot of people have a really hard time identifying these like basic core emotions because mm -hmm. we have so many layers and we should and we shouldn't feel that. We can get into that later. Um, and then there's the thoughts, right? So just being aware of what you're thinking rather than just being the thought, right? Mm -hmm. There's a difference between thinking, uh, let me, you know, I don't know, like, oh, I'm so stupid, right? Then actually perceiving the thought oh, wow, I just, I just, the first thought that came to mind was, I'm so stupid, right? That's really yeah. unhelpful. That's like you, 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 when you generate that, you create that observer mind, you become an observer of the thought. That is what self-awareness is. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that sounds, I mean, you, you said that that's first level, <laughs> right? I can't even imagine what the other levels are because that is already quite a challenge for a lot of people, being aware of what those thoughts are and being aware, like you said, being aware of what that feeling is. A lot of people don't know how to put that into language or they don't know how to mm. observe it. Where do you think most people are in terms of their level of self-awareness? That's such a, it's a hard question when we, when we always, when we say like most people, mm. right? I think everybody, when they answer that question, they talk about like their world. Because sure. we all live in like our bubble, right? Yeah. And in my world, um, in my world, I see I see everything. I I feel, and I don't know on on a statistic level how relevant this is for all of humanity. But in my world, in my society, I do see a tendency where things like meditation and yoga and mm -hmm. mindfulness and coaching, right, um, and retreats are becoming increasingly popular, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a path where people are like, well. Wow, like there's healing to be done within me. There's things about myself and the way I work that I didn't know. And I'm a coach, right? So I, I those kind of people come to me. Yeah. Um, and I work with them and I love that. Um and I also um and I also teach, right? Entrepreneurship and design thinking, emotional intelligence. And um you know, when I teach, I do see how little most people know about these things. Mm. Um I think that one of the things that shocks me and one of the reasons I feel that I'm here on earth is how did nobody teach us such basic things about our functioning? Like, why was I studying logarithms for so long yeah. in mathematics? Venn diagrams and yeah. probability. <laughs> like, I just have this trauma with logarithms, you know, because I spent so much time trying to understand them and I still don't know what they are. 
Um, but, you know, figuring myself out was like on the side. You know, mm. so I had to go to a psychologist. I had to write diaries and diaries and have conversations because I'm a deep conversations person since I'm like 13, you know, with people to try to figure it all out. And now I'm 30, right? And I always say I've been getting out of my own way for 28 years. And now I can bring it out to the world, right? Um, and it's beautiful and it has been what it has been. It wouldn't change anything. But it's like, well, we would have a lot Mm, better problems, I like to think, like higher quality problems, if we were taught this from the beginning. Because mm. cause right now, and, and what I mean by that is, right, what I was doing my whole life was getting out of my own way, right? Which was my own mind, my own mind and my own thoughts were my biggest, my number one obstacle. So what's an example of some of the thoughts you were having that, we, that were obstacles for you? I'm not good enough. Mm. To do to do what? To communicate what I want to communicate, to say what I want to say to people. Um, I am too sensitive to start my own business and deal with all the difficulties. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of the um, we all have an inner critic, right? And it's like these voices. This voice, little voice we have in the back of our head that whenever we want to take a risk or do something that is that we love or is meaningful or, or, or a goal that we, you know, a dream, this voice comes in and is like, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think you are, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we all have it and it comes in different shapes and forms. And for me personally, it was like, you're, yeah, you're too sensitive. You know, um, it was a lot of the voices of like things that my parents or grandparents expected me or told me I should be or do. Um, it was, you need one more degree. You don't have authority in this topic. Um, you know, you need more in order to be able to do this one thing. And I mean, you know, the inner critic or those voices could be useful to some extent, could um make us pursue certain things get some studies but there is yeah. a point where you got to be like that's enough yeah you know so what did you do to make friends or perhaps quieten down those voices i love that you said make friends because my my journey of self development has been becoming my own best friend literally yeah and i i'm i'm just such good friends with myself like <laughs> i have such a good time by myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like me and myself we just <laughs> hang out we're besties you know? literally this morning and today was like my day for my things and uh this morning I was alone at home you know and I was like meditating and just like talking to myself and I'm just in such a good vibe when I'm with myself you know what do you say when you talk to yourself um I I, I laugh a lot I laugh a lot okay. because because I'm laughing at the fact that I'm talking to myself and that it's so okay <laughs> And I'm just like, I'm so, I'm just so relieved that I allow myself to be me. That, yes. That's why I'm so happy. Because before, oh my God, it was so tiring to be in my head, you know, because, and I, and I was just, I just gave a talk last night about self-love yep. and it was about like acknowledging yourself and kind of letting yourself be. And the problem today and we're so caught up in like overthinking and over like rationalizing everything and it's so destructive mm. because you can't understand you can't understand everything with like logic and rational thought and so you know you you feel something and then you imagine you're angry at something right and then you're like wait i shouldn't feel angry right because i'm supposed to be zen and i'm supposed to be happy all the time or control myself let me let me reframe my thoughts so i can feel and then and then suddenly you're happy but then you're not really feeling happy so then you're like oh i'm you know and then you just start like layering up Mm. And it's like, you just have to stop thinking and maybe just go back and it's like, well, you know, this made me angry. You have to accept, accept. So I've, I've created a space now with myself where I just accept where I am, what I'm doing, who I am, where I'm going. Mm. And, and it's, it's delicious to be there. I love that word. I love you use the word delicious to describe it. That's beautiful. You know, I, I catch myself thinking sometimes, oh, I should be further along than where I am right now or I should have achieved more or 
made more money or whatever it is by now. Mm -hmm. And I remember I I shared this with a a hypnotherapist friend of mine even like a couple of years ago because I had the same thoughts back then and he said to me, what do you mean by by now? Like what does that even mean? Like Mm -hmm. how how are you – what are you even comparing yourself to? How are you measuring your success? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I don't know. It was just some arbitrary thought. Like I just feel like I should be more – like, and it had no basis for – comparison or, or anything yeah. and um so I like so when when you were talking about that about around just being okay with where you are right now and where you're going and that's okay you yeah. know it's it resonated a lot yeah and that that's you know that that word that that sensation right because again there's no amount of rational thought that can make you feel things like love or mm-hmm. fulfillment um or inner peace it, it's not a logical process, right? It's not like, oh, well, I am X years old and I am exactly at the place that society said, right? That that doesn't yeah. work like that. Or you don't say, oh, I have $100,000 in my bank account. I'm happy now. Exactly. Like that does not happen. Objective fulfilled. Check, right? Yeah, it doesn't happen. Yeah. So <laughs> we have all these like logical structures set up and, you know, a lot of the things, I was just talking about this this morning as well with a coaching client that... um you know, she's turning 34 and yeah, she's like, oh my God, am I where I'm supposed to be? Right. And, you know, I just turned 30 and a lot, there's a lot of thoughts around getting, hitting one of the decade, the big decade numbers. And I was like, what, who cares about this? And, and, you know, speaking, mm. and you know, this is really interesting because I think if self-awareness was going to start anywhere, it would be by identifying your useful thoughts and your unhelpful thoughts. Because you think, well, I'm thinking that I'm already this age, right? And then I'm creating expectations about what humans that have reached this age, particularly myself, should be doing. Mm. Does that help me in any way possible, <laughs> right? Yeah. Not really, no, right? It does not. Yeah. So it's very it's very simple, but, you know, and this is where self-confidence comes in as well. It's not a lot, like you're not going to reach self-confidence through a logical, rational process, right? Okay, I have X degrees or I have achieved this in my life. I am now fully self-confident. Mm. There's people who don't have any degrees and haven't had much experience and they're extremely self-confident. It's, it's, it's something that you decide because it's useful. So you're just like, well, I decide to believe in myself and whatever will happen will happen. All right, so... It's easy to say, (laughs) let's just decide to believe in ourselves, which is wonderful. (laughs) How do we start to cultivate that? How Mm -hmm. do we go about doing that? Because I think we're we're so programmed to using that logical, rational way of analyzing success or goal setting and progressing, right? It's you get the degree, you do the X amount of years of study, you work your way up, you get the promotion, you blah, blah, blah. You do it that way. And what you're saying, Samantha, is that does not pursuing a goal or or putting like a logical rational check next to a list is not going to bring us that self-confidence or that happiness so what is that what is the other side of it I would say and and, you know this is I made a decision when I was 22 years old when I I was in London um, my first not really my my first job out of college let's say full-time one and I started exploring myself, right? All these fears that I had and why I couldn't do that and this. And, you know, I I realized, and this is the first decision, that human beings are not rational beings, okay? And this is proven by psychology, 85 to 92, I think it is, percent of what we do is subconscious. So we think we're logical, right? We think we're like, yes, this and that, and not really. We're being driven by all this subconscious stuff. So... Mm. All, for me, that was powerful because the moment that you're like, okay, no matter how much I study and no matter what I do, I'm not going to understand like the human brain and why we do what we do logically and rationally. Yeah. Right. Like life is so much bigger than what we can rationally comprehend. So already that accepting that for me was a form of like surrendering, surrendering to something bigger than myself. I don't know if that makes sense. It was like, Okay, life is infinitely complex. Mm-hmm. I will never like my. I will never be able to wrap my head around it. Yes. So there's something. There's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that I'll never understand. Great, and that's okay, and that's fantastic. Let's, yeah. Like, in fact, if you can't accept that, you're probably going to be in big trouble, mm-hmm. right? Because we have like this obsession with control. Mm. 
All right. And that's normal because a little self-awareness for, for everyone, you know, our brain is wired for survival um, physically. So our brain thinks that if it can control something, it can make sure, right? It, it can it can just create certainty. Yeah. And certainty can guarantee survival. If you're sure you're going to have food, right, every night, that's a good indication that you're going to survive. Um, so given that our brain is always searching for that, we want to just control everything, right? Like instinctually. Yep. And this is why so many people freak out around public speaking and impromptu speaking. I hear this all the time because they can't control that. Mm -hmm. I can control, you know, reading off a script or I can control yeah. preparing for a presentation or a meeting. But as soon as someone asks me a question, that's heading into unknown territory and people can't they they don't have to deal with that unknown because they can't control it exactly yeah. and it's so scary it's scary yeah. you know and and one way to deal with this um with the brain because again for for me the first thing is self-awareness okay great my brain is wired for this so it's normal that letting go of control is scary mm. yeah that is um that is how my the, how that's how fear is wired in the brain yeah, it goes, the amygdala just is like, oh my God, right, alert of possible danger. And before it was like, you know, an alligator or a bear that was going to come eat you. And it's like, oh my God, yes, fear, run or freeze or whatever the body, you know, the mechanism decides. But now it's like, okay, the brain is seeing a situation as a possible threat to my life. But actually, right, my higher intelligence is like, I don't think I'm going to die, right? Mm. Um, I don't think that the possible rejection or judgment that I might feel from that risk is actually going to kill me, mm -hmm. right? Then you're like, okay, brain, all right, I know you're trying to protect me from this horrendous rejection I might experience if I go ask that person out or go speak in public, right? Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that risk, all right, because I'm not going to die. And what we can do is take our brain out of its comfort zone in little steps, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to do like the huge thing because our brain might enter like panic zone and really freeze. Um, we could do little things, right? To be like, hey brain, look, I'm doing this and it's not killing me. Oh, wow, okay. And then when, when the comfort zone starts to expand, your brain starts making these really dangerous things a bit safer, all right? Because that's how mm -hmm. neuroplasticity works. Like our brain has the capacity to reshape itself and it's doing it every single day. Now, with our actions, we can shape the direction in which it reshapes. I don't know if I'm getting too too deep now. Into so if we, is what you're saying, if we do that small thing to get out of our comfort zone, the brain then goes, oh, that wasn't so bad. So exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label that not scary now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you'll be more likely to do that in the future or then go to the next level. Exactly. And I'm sure everyone can relate to this. I mean, mm. we've all done, you know, it's like I always put the example of speaking a language, a new language. Mm. Yeah. Even if you're just going on vacation and you learn one word, you know, the first time you're like, what? Say it again. And then the first time you say it, you feel really dumb, you know, and am I saying it right? And you're scared they're going to judge you or not understand you. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. And then and then once you did it once and somebody understood you, the second time it's not that scary. And then, you know, obviously creating a sentence and then learning a full language, it's all about little tiny steps where your brain's like, okay, yeah, people might not understand you. You might get judged, mm. but it's okay, right? Um, and that's with literally anything, anything. Um, Samantha, I want to take a slight turn here. Mm -hmm. um, you talk, you mentioned before about learning how to, well, having that self-awareness, Part of a big part of that is learning how to be aware of our emotions and being able to name them and give a language to those emotions. And I've noticed this, um, a lot with the people that I coach, and I'm sure you come across this as well, where you ask people, well, what are you feeling? What's the emotion that's come up for you? And they say something like, I feel like he's not listening to me, which is not an emotion. So can we talk a little bit about that? Is it, yes. Firstly, is this something that you come across? Yes, a lot, a lot. And because we weren't taught emotional intelligence or any kind of emotion mm -hmm. work growing up, is why this is so difficult, right? So how do you feel is also rationalized. So why is it important that we can actually name those emotions? Hmm. So that's an interesting question. It's So emotions are, are physical and instinctual, yeah? So it's really important um, 
that before because we, we saw that the brain and the mind can like complicate things yeah sure and it adds like layers and it, it makes things quite confusing so when we kind of like get out of our heads and back into our body we get a lot of clarity right we're like okay wow and also a lot of healing is done through the body mm -hmm. much more than just through the rational brain so when we get out of our head and we actually name um an emotion that was triggered from even something we have experienced in our childhood maybe right or something that happened yesterday you know it doesn't matter um and we allow ourselves to actually feel it healing happens Healing happens because you are acknowledging a part of yourself, right? And, you know, I'll share an experience of, of a client that I had. And, um, you know, she was experienced, you know, she, she, had, she had anger and frustration from her childhood because of something that she wasn't allowed to do. I think this is a very common thing. Uh, we wanted something, but our parents kind of made us do something else. Yeah. And that's normal. It is appropriate to feel frustrated or angry because of that. Yeah. Because you are denying or somebody was denying a really important part of you. And the problem is that we layer it up, right? So it's like, oh, no, we justify our parents, right? Or no, but it's okay because this or that. And that's fine. But you still felt it. You still felt it. And if you don't allow yourself to feel it, that stuff is still stuck in your body. And it usually, not always, but it usually comes out in one way or another. You know, and it could be, uh, I'm sure everybody can, can relate to a time when something very slight, like something happened and then somebody just starts bawling, you know, just crying. Yeah. Or, or you know, the stupidest thing happens, or, and I mean stupid, by something very small and insignificant. And then, you know, you just blow up and scream. And that is just a sign of that emotion being repressed and not having any space to be felt. Right. So your your emotions like demand to be felt. Mm. And often like we we only realize it um unfortunately through pain, right? So pain pain is one of the biggest things that demands to be felt. Like you can't you can't uh avoid and not avoid pain but you can't deny it right mm -hmm. like if a, a little little pain you can be like oh it's nothing right but as the pain gets bigger it's like oh my god this really hurts yeah. it's like getting your attention um and that's what happens when we have a lot like big levels of anger inside of us or levels of sadness that we've never felt now if we allowed ourselves to actually name these and feel them more on a regular basis yeah we would be a lot healthier emotionally And what does that look like? Simply saying, I feel sad right now. Yes. I'm feeling really sad. Yes, literally. And then not having you or anybody want to make that sadness go away. Right. Now, so, so not having someone say, oh, don't feel sad. Exactly. It's okay. Because it's like, well, no, it's not. And I feel sad. <laughs> exactly. So please just validate my emotions and say, you're feeling sad. I can see that. I can understand you must be feeling really sad right now. Exactly. Mm. And but because we have such a complicated relationship with emotions in ourselves, like if we don't allow ourselves to experience sadness, right? Because we're uncomfortable, or we don't let ourselves get angry because we think it's inappropriate, then we don't allow for those emotions in other people either. Right? That's a really good point. So yeah. if somebody else is sad because my my own sadness makes me uncomfortable, if you're sad, I'm gonna be really uncomfortable. Or like, what am I supposed to say? Hey, yeah. cheer up, right? Shots, let's get shots. You know, whatever it is. Oh, it's such a it's such a um, an automatic reaction, isn't it? To be like, don't be angry, don't be sad, or don't be frustrated. Let's like, have a wine, have a glass of wine, and numb the feeling mm -hmm. like make it so that you can't feel it anymore exactly but like it's it's so hard to sit with that emotion when we don't want to feel it mm -hmm. it is um but when we start to change our thoughts around mm -hmm. emotions right and this is where this is what i'm why i think we need so much education around it right if we realize okay well wait sadness is not good or bad it just is mm. and it's giving me information okay, wow, that, that changes the way we start to feel about sadness. Yeah. The same with anger. Now, you know, one thing is feeling anger, identifying it. Another topic is how we express it and how it is appropriate to express it and with whom it's appropriate to yes. express it, right? That's another topic. But yes, if we, if we had more spaces just to allow it to be rather than judging it and shaming it, mm. a lot of the, the problems today that we have is because we shame the emotions that we feel. So what does that look like? 
that looks like um, maybe I'm angry, yeah, but I'm ashamed that I'm angry. So for a really clear example could be jealousy, all right? A lot of, I mean, it's not that easy. People, you don't hear people saying like, oh, I'm so jealous, right? I mean, unless it's like, oh, you're going to a trip to, Bal- to Bali. Yeah, so and, jealous. I'm yeah. so jealous of your shoes. <laughs> like real jealousy, right? Yeah, yeah. You're never going to say it because yeah. we're ashamed that yes. we are jealous, right? You're, it's like there's there's shame around jealousy and envy. And women, for example, um, have more trouble feeling anger. Right. Because there's a stigma between, you know, behind it or oh, this crazy woman. Right. Um, and the same goes with men and sadness. Right. Because like of the man up. Exactly. Like, boys don't cry. Exactly. Grow some balls. Exactly. Yeah. And there's like toxic masculinity. Yes. So they have a lot of shame around sadness. Right. So if they cry, they're judging themselves for crying because they're not enough of a man. Yeah. Mm. And so that really, again, that really complicates things because sadness and anger and you know the other core emotions they're a basic part of being human Mm. and we have to allow ourselves to experience them all to really live the human experience when when that's the new foundation right we start to change how we feel about the emotions we start to and, and and we can even sometimes invite them in all right so, wow, I'm sad. And, and I loved that yesterday in this workshop, um, one, one man, he said, I love sadness. And he said, I've understood so many things about my life when I'm sad. Wow. And I, w- I was like, I've never heard a man say that out loud, you know? And I was like, wow. Yes. And that is one of the purposes of sadness is acceptance. Acceptance of things that we can't change. Yeah. You know, and it makes us kind of just go more inside and reflect. Yeah. And a lot of beautiful things come out from that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I forgot where we were going with all this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I really love that. I think it's so important for people to um, understand or be, begin to know that it's okay to feel these negative emotions. Mm-hmm. And I – you know, I teach my clients and I do this with myself um, to be curious about that emotion. And instead of, say, if you get upset or you get frustrated, instead of going, oh, I shouldn't be upset or I shouldn't, you know, I should be happy about this, just going, oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm noticing that I'm feeling upset or I'm noticing that I'm feeling anxious, right? I wonder where that's coming from. Could it be, you know, that I'm doing something outside my comfort zone? Could it be that I value... Um, I expected this person to show respect to me in this way and they didn't based off what I thought, you know, so therefore I feel hurt, mm. you know, and and just creating that that curiosity around it and which I, I think it, it sort of takes away a bit of that shame side. So instead of thinking, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way, totally. I'm a bad person for feeling this way, going, oh, isn't that really interesting? I wonder where, you know, that comes from. And that's a great frame. And I think yep. one of the necessary things for self-awareness, just like become a little curious about yourself yeah, and explore, yeah, right? Because there's no right or wrong and you just are and you're great the way that you are. And it's just about learning how to navigate a little bit between, you know, those mind, body, soul and emotions. So, yeah. Love it. Well, Samantha, this has been so wonderful chatting with you. And I, I as you can tell, I love talking about this stuff <laughs> as well. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the Self Club and the work you do there? Yes. The Self Club is dedicated to spreading basically self-awareness and self-love, right? The self-acceptance part, which is crucial um, to any corner of the world, right? So in education is one of the big spaces, one-to-one um, as well, and in consulting with companies. Um, and now we're doing taking a lot of the courses online. Um, and it's a lot of self-discovery because I think we yeah. all need to start from the basics. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's a lot of what we do. Amazing. And what is one, what's one thing that people can do now to start c- cultivating more self-love? Hmm. I would say one of the, the key things that we talked about yesterday is Start identifying your needs, right? Your needs, which I relate a lot with your values. Mm. So what are those things that you really need in your life to feel happy, fulfilled, have a sense of purpose? 
and pay attention to them. Mm. Yeah, because just recognizing the things that are most important to you and creating a space and doesn't have to mean your whole job, right, is focused on that. But even a little thing you do every day to fulfill those needs is, I think, a beautiful, beautiful first act of self-love. Beautiful. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Samantha. And where can people best connect with you? Well, on Instagram, yeah, the self.club. And uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, if you give my full name. Sure. But yeah, I think those are the two best places. We're on Facebook as well. So, yeah. of course. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you, you so Christina. much. <laughs>